This is a balsam fir tree, and it's in grave danger. And for once, I'm not the cause of it. That's because this tree and the millions of acres of spruce and fir forest around it could be killed off over the next few years thanks to this guy, the spruce budworm. This thing might not look menacing, but it's one of the most destructive forest pests in North America. And last time it came through Maine in the 70s, it killed up to 97% of fir trees and up to 66% of red spruce in infested areas, devastating forests and the forest economy. It disappeared for a while, as it does, but over the last decade, it's been wreaking havoc in Quebec, leading to mass mortality and forest fires just across the border. Tariffs have proven ineffective at keeping them out, and now levels of overwintering larvae have skyrocketed across several hundred thousand acres on Maine's northern border. We might be in for a rough time, but all is not lost. We learned a lot of lessons from the last outbreak, and this time we have new technologies and new strategies. Specifically, we've seen great success out of New Brunswick with a so-called early intervention strategy that with strategic applications of pesticide on budworm hotspots have so far spared the province from a large scale outbreak. They plan on replicating that strategy here in Maine this spring, basically right now. So I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about the situation and of course, share some of my thoughts. Before I dive into the intervention strategy, you have to understand something important. The spruce budworm is not an invasive species. It's a native insect that has been part of the spruce fir forest ecosystem for thousands of years. We've found evidence of spruce budworm outbreaks dating back to the 1500s, and these outbreaks occur in cycles of approximately 30 to 60 years, a cycle that lines up fairly consistently with the maturation cycle of its preferred host, balsam fir. During endemic periods, the times in between outbreaks, Budworm populations remain low, kept in check by natural predators like birds and parasitic wasps. But occasionally, on these regular intervals, conditions align to trigger a population explosion so large, natural predators can't control the population. We're talking so many moths and caterpillars that they drop on the roads and create hazards for motorcyclists. That explosion typically is all-consuming. It feeds and feeds, and in the process, it kills fur and to a lesser degree spruce. The outbreak does not typically dissipate until they run out of food, when the trees die. In an undisturbed forest, this ecological boom and bust molds the northern forest ecosystem. It's just how these communities evolved. Some ecologists even consider the budworm to be a keystone disturbance agent, uh, meaning it plays a crucial role in maintaining the health and diversity of forests over time. Here's an example. Spruce fir and white pine often occupy the same ground, and honestly, fir has just about every strategic advantage over both, except for one, the ability to stay alive. So over time, the poorly named spruce budworm helps promote spruce and pine populations, and you can actually see that here in this picture of an infested stand from the last outbreak. The fir is very brown, the spruce is a little brown, and the white pine is thriving. If you're familiar with fire ecology, it's pretty similar. You can think of it like the fire equivalent of the damp and humid northeast, and it has just as consequential an effect on our forests. And that analogy is one I'll return to quite a bit. The problem here isn't so much that the budworm exists, it's that our forests have changed. Timber harvesting has made forests younger, and it's increased compositions of shorter-lived fir and softwood stands uh, than what we'd otherwise find. And now we have a forest economy in Maine that's largely based on spruce and fir lumber. So while our forests are ecologically robust and will survive either way, our forest economy is a bit more fragile, and so it does necessitate some form of intervention. When the last major outbreak hit in the 1970s, Maine's chosen intervention was both reactive and aggressive. Widespread aerial spraying of pretty harsh insecticides and massive timber salvage operations. It was the World War II of forestry, and everyone in the industry who was around talks about it that way. If you find an older forester around here and ask them, they'll take a long drag off their cigarette and tell you some war stories. Like about the time a C-54 converted into a pesticide sprayer caught fire and had to land in the Allagash. But those times were different in so many ways. Think back to that fire analogy. In the past, our objective more or less was to let the fire burn to let the outbreak do its things and stave it off with pesticide 
just long enough to allow us to salvage the timber. After all, you can only harvest so much a year, but massive swaths of forest were being defoliated annually. So unless you want trees to die on the stump, you have to try to slow it down. This, frankly, is the reactive route Quebec has taken during this latest outbreak with similar results. But New Brunswick has had a different approach. They thought that maybe, just maybe, they could proactively prevent the large-scale outbreak altogether by targeting hotspots before they reached a critical mass. And they call this approach the early intervention strategy. Now, in fairness, the difference here is not that no one's thought of this before, it's that it's never really worked before. But now, not only do we have more developed forests, we have better ways of tracking an outbreak. In the past, we didn't really know an outbreak was occurring until trees started turning brown. These days, the industry has been diligently keeping track of moth populations and overwintering larvae uh, by setting pheromone traps and clipping branch samples. And these were actually some of my first jobs in the woods when I was in college. Suffice to say, monitoring efforts have been going on for quite a while, and combined with other technologies like tracking moth swarms with satellite, we have a pretty good idea of where outbreak hotspots are and how they spread. It functions a lot like a forest fire, with embers being carried from one area to another and spreading the flame. Swarms of moths get carried by wind to new locations and lay eggs to form the basis of new population centers. And it appears in Maine that we have a fire burning from those mothy embers carried over from Quebec. And hundreds of thousands of acres are now affected and effectively in outbreak territory. So what's gonna be happening very soon, if it hasn't started already, is that as these larvae emerge, the areas are gonna be sprayed with two pesticides, BTK and tebufenazide, to bring down population levels. And what's really cool about this is just because budworm levels are elevated doesn't mean nature isn't working. The baseline mortality rate from birds and wasps is still 80%. 80% of caterpillars are eaten in normal outbreak situations. The pesticide application only increases the mortality to 90%. So it's just a 10% increase relative to the baseline. And that is sufficient from what we've seen to bring populations down below outbreak thresholds. So if they can do that, they can stave off the invasion and over the next several years, they'll continue monitoring hotspots and knocking them back as necessary, effectively sparing Maine from mass carnage. Now, just a very quick note about those pesticides. They're both targeted and affecting Lepidopterans. So moths and butterflies and their larvae or specifically their larvae. Uh, and they're both remarkably low risk. BTK in particular is just a bacteria that disrupts the stomach of the caterpillars. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's pretty complicated, uh, but it's pretty interesting stuff. So if you're interested, or especially if you're concerned, I'm going to leave a link to a conference I went to about all this, where the Maine State toxicologist spoke and gave a really comprehensive presentation explaining the function and toxicity of these chemicals. And he really covered all bases, so he's your guy to listen to. And really, if you want more information about any of this, check out that link and watch the entire event. They go into way more detail about all this. Um, it's about two hours, but it's worth it. The history alone is pretty amazing. So that's the overview, that's the situation. Now, I do have some thoughts on this matter, and full disclosure, I did used to work in the industry and the affected areas in Northern Maine. Um, I don't anymore, and I've lived many lives since then, so I'm just giving you my opinion right now, as I always do. From what I've seen, the vast majority of public discourse has revolved around spraying concerns, uh, which is completely understandable, especially considering the, we'll say, less than stellar historical legacy of budworm spraying, but it's very clear to me that this is all being done exceedingly responsibly and cautiously. They're using better equipment than back in the day, better chemicals, um, utilizing better planning methodologies, like uh, they're taking their time to protect wetlands and water bodies and other sensitive areas. And given all known data and analyses by the real experts, including the numerous state scientists involved, this is a good plan. I do have some questions about the severity of the laissez-faire worst case scenario. Um, our forests are very different than last time around, and frankly, I was thinking after 10 years of no real activity that it just wouldn't happen to any severe degree. I also have some questions about the end game because we haven't actually seen this uh, strategy totally succeed yet. The thing that ends butterworm outbreaks historically is consumption. So preventing that consumption introduces the possibility, I suppose, 
of a very prolonged outbreak or maybe even a disruption of the cyclicality that will result in shorter outbreak intervals. Uh, but really none of that is all that relevant because inherently we are dealing with uncertainty and so we have to talk about risks. The risks of action here aren't multiplicative, but the risks of inaction are. So action is clearly favored. The potential benefits massively outstrip risks, especially when you consider that Quebec and their reactive methodology has seen an increase of mortality, forest fires, and pesticide application relative to New Brunswick's program. My one concern with this is its funding. This is all being paid for mostly with public funds. Uh, with 12 million coming from federal disaster relief, personally secured by Susan Collins, uh, 2 million from state funds, and only 1 million from private funds. Now these totals I don't really think show the whole picture. Uh, this is almost certainly not going to be a single year project. And if we look at New Brunswick as our example, which I think is fair, they've sprayed around 1.4 million acres so far, which at a cost of $45 per acre is 63 million, and the costs are still climbing. The implicit suggestion here, I guess, is that it will continue to be funded in the same manner. The justification for this is essentially a public good argument. Uh, it can save $794 million in economic impact annually and protect 3,865 jobs. Um, there is a practical reality to that, certainly, but it is fundamentally a too-big-to-fail argument. And so it does necessitate, I think, a greater conversation about the role of government in private forest protection. Because this is, for the most part, private land that's affected. It's a private asset. I fundamentally do not believe it is the responsibility of the taxpayer to backstop forest investments, nor do I believe that any forest landowner, or any landowner period, is ever entitled to positive cash flow. And to be clear, I hold that position across all industries and all asset types. If we were talking about an invasive species, I'd be more inclined to accept the public good argument here. Uh, but because spruce budworm is part of the ecosystem and outbreaks are largely foreseeable and self-insurable, I don't think it's appropriate. I could go into more detail, but I'll spare you the macroeconomic manifesto. Uh, but I probably will do a broader video about subsidies at some point because my views here are unpopular, we'll say, and uh, they deserve some explanation. Suffice to say, this would go one of two ways. It could end up being a short-lived, relatively inconsequential threat or it could be a prolonged battle and disrupting the cyclicality of budworm could cause it to become an ever-present potential. The more we lean towards the second scenario, the more the current structure becomes untenable, obviously. Um, but what I'd like to see happen is that this is treated essentially like wildfire. In Maine, firefighting is paid by a small excise tax on large forest landowners. It's about 26 cents per acre. Uh, and that's enough to average out and internalize the often unforeseeable costs of wildfire. And uh, I'd like to see that program expanded for budworm, probably with differential rates by township dependent on spruce fir composition, something like that. Because like fire, there is a legitimate argument for being it organized more centrally. It's just a matter of that substantial cost being internalized so markets can actually work like they're supposed to. In any case, I think it'll be really cool to see what happens. Uh, if we can effectively prevent spruce butterm outbreaks, that could be a real game changer for forestry in northern Maine. Now, spruce budworm is just another reminder that forestry is a difficult game with a lot of nuance. I'm just trying to make it easier for you. So if you want to learn more about managing your forest, you can grab my free ebook, How to Read Your Forest, uh, which you can get in the description in the comments below. And of course, if you really want to take your forest management to the next level, you can join Silvicultural, the forest syndicate. Get access to our web mapping application that allows you to delineate your property, harvests, and trails. Analyze your forest using normal color, color infrared, or LIDAR imagery. Export that imagery to use in the field with GeoTIFF and GeoPDF readers. Estimate stand volumes by uploading cruise data to your stands to get species level statistics. And plan regular timber harvest using our robust area control framework to ensure your management is sustainable. If you have any management questions, you can ask our custom Forester AI, enhanced with a knowledge base of forestry textbooks, technical guides, manuals, and studies to give you the best answers to your forestry queries as possible. Silvicultural is built to allow you to be your own forester, and we have lifetime memberships available that will give you access to not just these features, but all future releases with a one-time purchase. So if you're serious about managing your forests, go ahead and give it a look. I'd love to see you there. All right, guys, that's all for now. Later.